Hey guys, and welcome back to Talking with Shadows, the conversation everyone has but no one wants to admit to. Here with your host Vic Waitley and Marcus D. And guys, sorry we weren't able to make an episode last week for you guys. Both me and Vic have been down. We've been sick. It, it's just not been good around here, guys. It's, it's just been a tidal wave of mucus. Yeah, you, you wouldn't have wanted yeah, to Yeah, no, no, no. But we're both back. We're recording here in the studio. We're super excited to be here today. And we got some great stuff to talk to you guys about today. Some of it didn't even happen until today. Yeah, like about 30 minutes ago or so. But first, of course, we want to make sure that uh, we give you the black bag tip of the day. Okay, tip of the day is carry a live hive of bees in a backpack. Men in black come at you, you take that off, start swinging around, you can throw it at them. No one wants to deal with a guy who has a bunch of bees. Or if they try to sneak up from behind and get you, all of a sudden it disturbs the nest and they start swarming the men in black. Oh, and if you're allergic to bees, carry an EpiPen. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we care about your life, but uh, make, sure, make, sure, make sure you have that EpiPen. But, okay, let's talk about the weirdness that happened. Okay, let, let me set the scene for you here. Uh, we broke from our normal ritual. Maybe that's why this happened. We normally get a, uh, like, a sonic shake or something before we record, but we decided not to do that, and we went out for some Chinese food. And we're discussing uh, what we're going to be talking about today, the van meter monster or the van meter visitor however you want to say it and then t- tell them what happened it, it was so we're we're sitting around debating this theory that i have for later for where this monster may have came from of could this thing have been encased in rock or something and all of a sudden right next to this guy who was sitting by himself in a suit very well dressed goes hey i have a theory for you <laughs> what would you say if all of a sudden and then goes into this long tirade about trying to breed blind fish in a cave like how many generations it would take or breed blind fish like yeah, in he, a stream i was lost like halfway through this yeah he was talking about getting white perch from the river and then not feeding them only allowing them to eat each other and then like trying to breed them in darkness so they wouldn't see i'm not totally sure the purpose of the experiment <laughs> and he was he was pushing the conversation we ended up talking about like deforestation like lack of oxygen like in the atmosphere and like rainwater like in tree like how much water trees take up and deforestation like getting rid of all like having all this water disappearing to, to the point where he wanted us and keep in mind he engaged us, th- us with this question and then wanted us to come up with the answer of how much water is contained in tr- in an acre's worth of trees and he was like just hell bent on getting vic to work this problem out. Yeah, he actually handed me his phone. No, 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 no. He threw his phone at that, you. That's right. He, he threw his phone at me, so I had a calculator. And so I started doing equations, and I'm like, okay, a acre's roughly this size, and we'll estimate this many trees per square feet. And then we had to figure out, like, how much water is in so many pounds of tree. It, it just got weird. And the whole time, I'm just I'm texting... Vic's wife going, you are not going to believe the conversation that we are having. Because it's so weird. But the whole time that that got me with this guy was just so just convinced that he was leading. I felt like he was trying to lead us to the, just this idea, this this truth about something. And he goes, he goes, trees hold like about 30 pounds of water. Like, like do you, do you see? Like, he's like the guy from like Red Dragon, like showing like C- Philip Seymour Hoffman, like these like grotesque things. He's like, and the water has to go somewhere. Do you see? <laughs> Did I ever tell you what was in my fortune cookie? No. It, but, well, okay. While we're having this conversation with him, I open up my fortune cookie and my fortune is the answer is very near look around. That's, I, I'm still looking because I was very confused as to what was going on. Like, I like to me. I thought what he was really going for was because he's a very nice dressed guy, very educated. I thought this was like a young Earth creation. It's like what he's doing. He's like you know, it's it's easy to breed these sort of monsters because the Earth isn't that old. I thought that's where this was going, and that's how you could see all these monsters in the paranormal. Nope. No, it didn't really go anywhere. Much anywhere. Yeah, I know. Like I eventually just kind of got us out of the conversation, or we would have never made it to the record show. We had a long conversation with this guy, yeah, he, but he started like asking me to do equations for him 
and he would only give me variables and then ask me for the answer. He's like, what, what's, what's X plus Y? And then not give me any information and then really legitimately expect me to give him an answer. And Vic, Vic, Vic's looking at me like for me to help him with his math equation. I'm like, I was lost a long time ago, man. I'm like, I, I couldn't even show my work. I'm like, Ugh. He's like, I'm not terrible at math, but it definitely is not my strong suit. I, and I can keep up with most equations, but if you get into advanced math or something, you throw me for too much of a loop, and I'm not no, I'm not going to know what to do. And when you're giving me nonsense math, I, <laughs> all I can do is politely say, we have to go record a podcast yeah. now. Goodbye. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's one of the weird things. When you're really into the paranormal and you're studying and you get on that, you will just be just very interesting, eccentric people. Oh, and if you want to know what the guy looked like, have you ever, if you've ever seen the picture of the, have you seen this guy dream study thing? He looked like that guy. In a suit. Yeah, in a suit. In a suit, eating Chinese food. I, I assume that he's our man in black, and the whole thing was an attempt to intimidate us from the paranormal. Although I, yeah. I thought he would be, like, a little more intimidating. This guy wasn't very intimidating. It, it was weird. Like I, And for a minute, like, on the way back, Vic lost his... You lost your phone. So, like, mm-hmm. I, I really thought this guy had stolen, like, Vic's phone. Like, oh, man, the government's got him. <laughs> like, I was smart. I'm not going to get anywhere to let him get anywhere near me in case something's going to happen. Yeah, I, I let him get kind of close. I yes, you was, did. <laughs> it was weird. I'm like, whoa. And I made sure to shake his hand afterwards. I, I did too. I mean, it was it was very. And he, it was a really. He was smart. I mean, he was getting into mm-hmm. some really cool stuff. But like, just he interrupted our conversation. Like he had a point to what we were saying. Yeah, like, he, was, he was just at a adjacent table about like just monsters trapped in rocks. Like that. That's what I was. That's my point. I was getting at. What What I want to know is, was he just way smarter than us? Or, like, was he just way crazier than us? I really couldn't I tell know. if he was so smart he was on a different level or so crazy he was on a different level. But I'm pretty sure it was one of those. I don't think it was crazy because his hair was very well kept. No, yeah, that's true. People that are weird that you can tell, like, they're, for some reason they stop keeping their hair or whatever. They get, like, the Bernie Sanders hair where it's, like, out to the sides. You should see me, like, after I do, like, that thing where I start doing y- uh, yarn and pins across maps and start doing those web diagrams to try to get <laughs> answers. After I do that for a few days, I look real unkempt. Or I'm falling down the rabbit hole looking at conspiracy theories and I'm, like, texting you at, like, 2 o'clock in the morning. Yep. Worried the government's finally discovered what I'm doing. Or afraid there's either skinwalkers or cultists out on your lawn. <sighs> Well, here's one of the things we realized afterwards. Neither of us asked him his name or anything like that. And I, I didn't ask because I was afraid he's going to be like, oh, my name, Indrid Cold. Or he was going to say, like, no, you don't need to know my name. But we know your names, Vic and Marcus. <laughs> I'm like, that's finally happening. And I can't remember any of Vic's black bag tips <laughs> that he's been saying. But it was just a very strange, extremely surreal encounter. It was kind of similar to, like, some of the people who have those strange encounters with, like, injury cold-like characters. Mm -hmm. But though ours was less bizarre, I guess, it was a little more grounded. Nothing really all that strange happened besides just a very odd man with a very odd conversation. It's like running in your cold at a Chinese restaurant. Yeah. (laughs) Eating cookies. Well, man, if, if you're out there, thanks for the awesome conversation. I'm yeah. sorry we couldn't quite keep up mathematically, but I really think that that, that formula you gave me was either a trick or your math was wrong. Yeah, you start throwing math equations <laughs> at us. We're, no, we're out. But it was, it was just a very strange thing. It just literally happened about, what, 30, 30 minutes ago, somewhere yeah. around there? Yeah, so thought we'd share that story with you guys. But... Okay, are we ready? Yes, we're on to the topic of the day, the Van Meter uh, Visitor. No, the Van Meter Monster. No, the Van Meter Phenomenon. The Van Meter Visiting Monster. Cryptid. Thing. Guy. Man. Yeah. However you want to say it, it's still it's still a really, really cool story. Half the people seem to call it the Van Meter Visitor, and the other half seems to call it the Van Meter Monster, and both have the same amount of alliteration, so... Whatever you want to call it. We just we're all that way. We all know what we're talking. That's about. That's what we're talking. We're about talking today. about this winged creature that popped up in Van Meter back in like 1903. Okay, throw us a little bit of the backstory. So okay, so so the backstory. Of this is about like really late September, like September 28th, 29th, 1903. The town of Van Meter, Iowa, was plagued or visited by this weird like, half-humanoid, bat-like creature that several people in the town saw. And it's a little different than most 
like basic like either Mothman or winged humanoid stories because this this has its own little cool little kind of thing. So the very first guy that sees this creature is this uh, businessman. He sells like tools. His name's like uh, oh gosh, I can never remember pronouncing these guys' names. It's like U.G. Griffith. That's his name. So this guy U.G. Griffith is awoken because he sees this weird, strange light. And I'm not talking like UFO light. We're talking like imagine like if someone shined. Wait, a... Wasn't he walking home? Was he walking yeah, home? He was I walking was home from a, from a business trip. I thought. Yeah. Well, he all of a sudden he sees like this this like uh, this light in the sky. And again, it's not like a UFO light where he's seeing it, and it's not like uh, just this weird floating orb. It's like a spotlight shining down. And it's really disturbing. And he sees this, like, he described it as, like, eight foot tall with these bat-like wings with this horn coming out of its head creature with this uh, giant light shining from the top of its head. And it freaks him out. And he does what I think makes this sound even more credible because I don't know why this doesn't happen to the story. He tries to shoot this thing. He tries to blast it. No. Yeah, he does. The, no, the first guy doesn't try to shoot. He just goes home. No, Yuji, he tries to shoot. I'm, uh, I'm absolutely convinced of this part of the story. Okay, okay. Well, the reason why is because there's a lot of people that try to shoot. There are this a thing. lot of people who try to shoot. Let's fact check this one real quick. Okay, while we're fact checking, we'll talk about I it. I will bet you eight Bigfoots the first guy doesn't shoot. I bet you six Mothmans that he does. That's cool. I'd rather have Mothmans than Bigfoots. Uh, says you, I like Bigfoot more. Oh, really? You that think Bigfoot's dude, more interesting than Mothman? I think he is way more interesting than Mothman. He's got way more cooler... He's got a lot more interesting stories. He... Uh, there's at least more stories. I don't think they're more interesting. He has, le- he has less superpowers. Uh, it depends on the story that you go with. I like some of the Bigfoots where he's got, like, fairy powers where he can, like, <laughs> teleport and fly and grows wings. I've never heard of Glows. He does like He does, like, peanut butter, apparently. Mm-hmm. Just, just I, I like the stories where he's just this odd goofball wandering the wilderness, getting into hijinks, and looking for people. Just imagine Winnie the Pooh, but instead of honey, it's peanut butter, and instead of being tiny, he's massive. That's the Bigfoot I like. Okay, we got the page popped up. I'm pulling it up. The following day, Griffith told the people in town about the odd floating light he saw in the Dang it! <laughs> Guess who just won six Mothmans? <laughs> now I have all the Bigfoots and all the Mothmans. This is weird. I wrote this on my notes that it was down there because I wrote each of these stories down there. And under his story, I said it shrugs off, like like that it shrugs off bullets. Uh, that's in several of the stories. It's just mm-hmm. th- this thing was cited by a lot of people, guys. And there's a lot of stories about the sightings. And one of the interesting things. A lot of the people who spotted it were actually really heavily respected in the community. Mm. But okay, what, what, what happens yeah. next? So over the next couple of days, and like Griffith is spreading this story around town, and so many other people are coming forward to say like that they had seen this thing too. Like there was one of the cashier, uh, like one of the bank cashiers, Peter Dunn. There was a famous doctor that was in the town. Uh, this guy named O.V. White comes forward. I think he runs. The, I think he was running the hardware store. All of them come forward talking about that they had seen this creature too, and they had, most of them had tried to like blast this thing away with shotguns or bullets, and it just shrugs off bullets. What what's happening in 1903 that everyone's packing heat and we're just ready to start shooting? It's, <laughs> it's middle America, turn of the century, man. Okay, I just said this so many times in some of these stories. I don't understand how these stories don't. End with, and then I pulled out my gun because if you saw an eight foot creature with bat like wings that looks like it could carry you away, so, I'm I'm done. Spoiler alert, guys! It it never works. It yeah, it doesn't work. And at least none of this because that's one of the prevailing themes about the Van Meter uh, visitor is that it just you, no matter how much you shoot it, it doesn't care. It's like bullets, eh, whatever. I'm bulletproof. It kind of seemed like all it really did was get its attention. It seemed mm-hmm. to have been at least aware it was being shot at. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't like it was on a different dimensional plane or something. Yeah. And and some of the other people in the town were talking about that the behavior that it was was uh, that it would hop around like a kangaroo when it wasn't flying around. Like it would just like, like it had its wings like together and it was just hopping around and stuff like that. And there were people that claimed that like they even pulled this. Uh, three-toed plaster of its foot. Although I haven't seen any actual photos of that for me to believe that. I've seen a re-sketch of it. Um, in one of the books on it, there's a re-sketch of the plaster cast. And it's it's a very odd sort of footprint. It, it kind of goes outward like a star. It's a sort of footprint like I've never seen anything 
even remotely resembling it. Mm-hmm. And it, and it's it's really weird when you look at this story though because the the, the descriptions of it, it, the uniform cross is that it has these bat like wings, and that it has this light shining from its head. But after that, it doesn't really get much into what the skin actually looks like. And you and you see this when you see different artworks. Because you will see some people that would describe it looking like a man bat. Like it looks like some sort of a giant were bat. Or you'll have other people drawing it that it looks like Mothman. Or you'll have other people drawing it that it's a pterodactyl, essentially, with a giant flashlight on its head. Yeah, and the idea of like it having having a glowing horn, like bioluminescence, isn't something unknown in the animal world, but I've never heard of something having a glowing horn. And and several people claiming that they know for a fact that they shot it and and it didn't and it didn't do anything. I'm surprised that there is not more of a clear description as exactly to what this thing actually looks like. Well, I mean. All the all the sightings happened at night, and it had that bright light. It probably odds are people were somewhat blinded by it. Yeah, it's kind of like um, it's kind. I mean, I don't like use this. It's kind of like when the police shine a light like right in yeah. your face and kind of obscures. You can't really see what's yeah, going on. What they look like, you know, or some military. I think others some like tactical uh, guns do the same thing, mm-hmm. where they where they put a strobe essentially in your face so you can't see kind of what they look like. And maybe that's a defensive mechanism. I mean, I, it, it could be. It, it makes sense. I mean, there are creatures with bioluminescence uh, in the, ab- the abyssal zones that will use those flashes of light to confuse uh, confuse prey. Mm-hmm. And they also said that this thing had like a horrible stench. That was another thing that was yeah. prevalent too, that it just smelled super funky. And so this thing is being spotted all over town. Numerous people are seeing this. They're finally building up into, um, into the very early parts of October. When the owner of this brick, uh, like this brick company, is is with an abandoned mine nearby, a coal mine nearby, says that he hears this horrible shriek, this horrible sound, uh, and he, and I, th- he's described it as like the shrill metal sound is what he described it as, like it was this awful shriek, and so the town, being the reasonable people that they are, uh, gathered up a posse, <laughs> and they decided to go camp at this mine. And sat in front of the mine until they found it. And not only did they find it, but they also found a smaller version of it that it was flying around with. Until finally they they lit this thing up. Several people in the posse just shoot these two things. And again, they don't care. And, and how, how did they describe it? Like, they lit it up. Like, they blasted it so much. They used enough firepower that it was sunk the Spanish fleet. <laughs> These guys have amazing turn of phrases. Yeah, it's it's oh god, it reminded me of like a, like a old time like Baptist like sermon like yeah, some yeah. of the some of the analogies these metaphors these guys are using, and uh, so they they shoot it and it doesn't care or whatever and it ends up going back down into this mine like they did, they did both of these things disappear into the mine and they close the mine off and it's never seen again, <laughs> never seen again never never comes back. So if we track down the mine, you wanna. You want to open it? No, I don't. I, I kind of want to open it. I, I don't know. I don't. I don't know. If I, I don't know what else might come out of there. I don't. Maybe it's a. Maybe it's a path to the hollow earth. Maybe it's a gateway to hell. Oh, you went just straight dark. I'm thinking like <laughs> awesome, like you know, Jurassic Park and do, like. Do, do, do. And instead, you just went gateway to hell. I, or, I, I don't know. This thing has such an odd description, and actually, one of my favorite accounts of it is. Um, a guy spots it on top of one of the large lamp posts, just kind of perching there. And as it's climbing down, it's um, it's like grabbing the base or the uh, stock of the lamp post with its beak to keep it stable. And it kind of reminded me of how, like you know, a um, a parrot moves. Mm-hmm. You know, if you ever see a parrot kind of climbing around, it'll stabilize itself on the beak as it's moving the legs. Mm-hmm. And I thought that that was a neat little addition. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, mine is not as uh, biology. As Vic likes to do, but it's describing like it's hopping around like a kangaroo, and it gave me like these memories of like Petey from Land Before Time, where he, when he can't fly and he's just hopping around like on some places. Which I mean, it's like what it's probably gonna do if it can't fly just from the ground. Ha- nothing about this kind of how a parrot moves on the ground a lot. That, you know, that is how parrots hop. move. Yeah. Was this a giant parrot with a spotlight on its head? No, I think that it was a, a giant. Some sort of bird creature that does that. I don't. Bats might do that. I don't I, know. If bats have. That, that's what they do too. But. Now they kind of do this quadrupedal crawl thing, um, but no, like 
it, it, it must be it must be something that has at least a similar biological motion with the mm-hmm. way that they're describing how it moves on the ground. It seems to be similar to it climbing. It can fly as well. And it seems to have the same sort of dynamic motion you would expect from, like, say, a parakeet. Now, since we're talking about birds and we're talking about a large cre- winged creature, do you know something that I just don't, I don't get? So there's this weird part of the story that's missing from this. So for several days, this large eight foot winged creature is flying around this town there is no giant piles of poop anywhere oh i didn't even think about that it's flying around in a town and it and it and it, and it lives like in a supposedly in this mine shaft wouldn't you think that that would be part of the, well, like you would just think anybody who owns a bird knows knows how much they do or just owns like just rep like a large rep like a large wicked creature like that. You'd have to watch out for that, and it, and it's nowhere in this. I know this is the weird stuff we have to think about. This yeah, is why no. you guys come to the channel and that, <laughs> listen that to the podcast. That just blew my mind. There, I'm like, yeah, there should be like giant monster scats around. I just blew your mind with poop. A little, yeah, yeah a little <laughs> bit. <laughs> like I can't like why well, we don't find like Bigfoot like turds out in the wild because it's huge and and it's vast, so it's hard to find. But we we know where it was. Yeah. And it kind of sounds like you're saying Bigfoot's poops are vast. No, the area where you'd have to look for it is vast versus maybe like in this small town where you probably would see it more likely. Yeah, and it probably didn't smell that good either. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, but what what does that mean? Like, does this mean that maybe it was not a biological creature? Uh, it could mean that it was wasn't a biological creature. It also probably kind of plays to maybe that it was a hoax and just mass maybe. hysteria. I don't know. Or well, also we're talking about the turn of the century. Maybe it would have just would have been considered to be imprudent to record that information. Probably it probably just would have been. This isn't what people want to know about at this time. I and mean, people weren't like in, at least in like smaller towns they weren't that scientifically minded. Like even the doctor was. I think this is around the time period where he may have just been a, a doctor barber. Mm-hmm. So I, it's not like they had a scientist bring this up and recording this in a technical way. It might have been just, eh, I found this big pile of poop on me. It's like, no, 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 you're in public. <laughs> don't talk about that. Don't don't talk about that. So it might just be one of those things that just didn't get recorded. That was a very long, we're thinking about, where does it poop? <laughs> if it doesn't poop, what does that, what does, what does that mean? Well, you, you you just opened up a new avenue that I just had not thought about yet. <laughs> so I had to think it all the way through. This did not come up in our conversation with the guy at the Chinese restaurant <laughs> uh, at all. Um, but one of the things that uh, to, to a lot of people thought at the time um, that I saw, because if you see some of the newspaper clippings you can kind of find online, some people thought that it might have even just been like a robber in a suit. Yeah, I saw those. I, they thought it might have been like a robber up on stilts trying to look through windows and he had a spotlight. Which seems very, very peculiar. Like, it's almost like it's the founding of the Legion of Doom. Like, this is like a... I love how people talk about this. Like, this is a this is a proto uh, uh, Mothman. I'm like, maybe it's a proto Man Bat. I don't know. From DC. I don't know. Like, I really don't think that there was a guy going around in stilts with a spotlight on his head that was somehow being mistaken that for a flying monster. Mm. That just seems like just a very odd thing for just, like, even just as a robber. Like, I really don't think that would be what one would do because the problem with stilts is if you get caught, it's hard to run away with. Yeah, I think most of the, like, the robbers in the time period were still thinking, that's not, they would think, like, that's a... That's a lot of work for <laughs> for just walking up going, give me your money. <laughs> like, I just, I don't think that would be their thing. Like, I, I get some of the initial thoughts. Like, because the first guy who saw it, the, his first thoughts was, maybe this is a robber. Because all he saw was a light up on the building. But then once he got a better look, he's like, oh, no, that's something else. I'm going home. Well, you know, another thing that people thought that it could be just mass stare. Because if you think about it, you have one person that claims that they think they saw something. Maybe he's... Some guy thought that he saw this, you know, he saw a light in the sky and he, he extrapolates it to be this this creature or this thing or whatever. He doesn't know what it is. And then the rest of the town just goes in this huge fervor because people are like, oh, do you see it? Have you seen it? It's kind of like when the the cops put up a, a photo of a, of a sketch of a have you seen this person. And they'll, they'll get flooded just with constant calls. Like anytime they do that with people saying, oh, yeah, I saw him. I saw him. I saw him. And 
But yeah, but mm-hmm. you usually don't get city leaders like falling into that sort True. of mass hysteria. And many True. of the people that um, that had spotted were like the civic leaders of the town. I agree. Mm-hmm. Like, I think if it's something along those lines, I'd almost wonder if maybe it was manipulation or something like that. Because it's not just unique that so many civic leaders saw it. It was almost odd that so many of them saw it. Like, more than one would expect. Like, to me, it is the town itself. I believe that they they believe they had some sort of threat. Yes. Like, there was some sort of threat that they had to get together to deal with. And... Whatever that threat was, they were going to follow through this course of action and say, we dealt with this threat because we're the sea leaders and we're responsible for the town. Like we're going, to, we're going to make sure this gets taken care of. Okay. Someone has to throw this out. It probably came from the mine. Are we thinking Hollow Earth? Like, is this, does this mine go all the way down, you think? Did the dwarves <laughs> dig too deep? I don't think it would have been an abandoned mine. I mean, if you think about it, there's only two reasons about why you would have an abandoned mine like that that's not sealed up, by the way, if you found something down there. It would be like, there's no coal, or there's poisonous gas. I mean, it might have been like they had dug in all sorts of directions and didn't find anything, but like maybe there was just this, this large drop-off that they didn't know where it ended. Yeah. And maybe that end goes to the Hollow Earth. I, I'm not a big Hollow Earth guy uh, person, guys. It's just one of those theories that I find interesting but is not necessarily my cup of tea. But this has kind of a, a, a Hollow Earth vibe to me. Like just some creature crept up from the depths <clears throat> yeah. of the Earth and got where it shouldn't have gotten to. And then they just sealed it back up. Or maybe the goblins from, like, Hellier breathe these down <laughs> in the mines. I don't know. And those... <sighs> The creature seems, okay, there's at least one thing that makes me think this cannot be biological in the traditional way. It's with the bioluminescence. Yes, things have it, but I don't know anything that can project it in a beam. Like, it, when things have bioluminescence, to the best of my knowledge, it's producing things that are along the lines of ambient light. Light that just goes off in all directions. It's non-focused. Right. Like, think about, like, an anglerfish. It's not like he can aim that thing as a beam. It's just like a little lantern on the end of a string. Well, if you have a lot of creatures that have those eyes that can see in the dark, like, the, mm-hmm. that, it might be, that it might be able to, they're going to have those, like, luminescent eyes that you'll see, like, whenever it's, like, lit up, like, like with, like, ambient light that's around or whatever, mm-hmm. I guess. So, maybe the light is hyperbole. It could be that they're not really seeing a strobe light. They're just hyperbole, like, seeing this eight-foot creature with glowing eyes because... Like, lights being shined on this thing. And they're just a shramming of the strobe light. Or it only had one eye. Oh, uh, maybe. I but don't know. I mean, it, it just seems very odd to me that it it just seems to always be described as being like a spotlight projected in a beam sort of way. Mm-hmm. And that part's so consistent through it. It just makes me think that uh, it seems like it seems more like a headlight. Mm-hmm. Then it does what I would expect from something that has bioluminescence. Well, that's why you have people that think that it was like an extra dimensional creature, like a cane thing, which is like, you know, an easy thing of, oh, it, it, it has this for some other sort of reason because it's from another dimension. Then it came over here and, and that's why it has for some reason that we don't know, you know, because it evolved outside of our, you know, reality. I would almost wonder if it was one of those cases of bizarre technology like it was some sort of mechanical suit or something like that. I think even like uh, in the book Flying Humanoids, mm-hmm. they theorize stuff like that. But then I, how do you explain the smaller one? That now that makes me go right back to the biological. We're like smaller it's a co-workers. Proxy. We're smaller co-workers. And I guess maybe. I, I, I guess that could be <laughs> the same. We're some co-workers half our size. Now that's true, but we're all both like kind of freakishly tall. I know. Maybe that was a normal size for it. <laughs> eight, you know what? Eight feet is freakishly tall. Maybe a four foot, five foot. Creature, that's a normal person. Maybe, maybe he was their, maybe he was their Vic and Marcus of their dimension. Who knows? I don't know. But, you know, and that might explain why it's bulletproof is because it's wearing some sort of suit, and that's why it's being bounced off. And maybe also why it, maybe it's a robot, and that's why it has this metallic screech when it screams. I don't know. And the other thing is, most people describe the light coming from the horn, and once again, not an expert on bioluminescence, but as I understand it. Most things that possess bioluminescence do so because the the body cultivates um, phosphorescent bacteria. The bacteria is actually producing the glow, mm-hmm. and that's why you have things like like that fish that swims up to things and spits glowing liquid out mm-hmm. because it has it just releases a colony of glowing bacteria. But something like a horn isn't really conducive for for anything like that. 
just the whole thing seems very peculiar almost more like technological or mystical sort of thing or like maybe it could be technological like if you think about like a mine what's the reason why miners use a lot of headlight like a lamp like on like a light on their head so they can see maybe this was so it could see around here Oh, maybe, and may it's also possible that this, if the, if we're assuming this is something that has been in the Earth, I don't know why a flying creature would be there unless there's like a hollow Earth sort of thing, or maybe we're talking about like the uh, South American belief that caves are portals to another dimension, on why you would really want to be like only hanging out in the cave as a flying creature. I know bats fly and live in caves, but they're small <laughs> enough to make it. They're small enough to make it work, and you'd, they come out a lot. You'd have to have a Big cave for something yeah. eight, like eight feet flying around. Yeah, there's not going to be. There's probably not. Oh god, I hope there's not colony of these <laughs> things. Like thousands of them all cu cuddled up in there. Gosh. Especially since we can't kill them with bullets. These things would take over. <laughs> Gotta do something. This is the exotic invasive that would take out man. Yeah. <laughs> like <sighs> it. It also does it strike you kind of like a very pterodactyl or pterodon sort of uh, sort of description. Yeah, it does. That's why I go with the idea that it, that it was probably more lizard-like than this man-bat photos that you see around everywhere, this Mothman Im image you see everywhere. And But that, that makes me believe that it could be some sort of a reptile too because I the actual theory we were discussing when the gentleman at the Chinese restaurant came in was we was this idea that there's this phenomenon and where people will open up rocks and trees sometimes too and will find living lizards inside like like a slab of rock will open up and a snake or a frog or turtles will come out and these things will do that we actually attempted to do a video on this back in season one a long time ago but then like we we had like five videos in our backlog and then our computer just blew up yeah. i think the men in black pulled the plug destroyed exactly. our computer saying we, we were about to do a top five things that can't be explained this was one of them <laughs> Yes, the video just that just never happened. Yep, and 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 it's weird. And this cool phenomenon, you can totally look this up. But that's what happens. People will open up these rocks or these uh, these slabs of concrete, and these reptiles have been staying in these pockets. And once it's opened up and it's exposed to air again, they wake up from I guess a hibernation, and they're fine. And uh, the reason I bring that up is there's this story, and some people think it's a hoax, and some people think it's a real, depending upon what you you know what you dig into but like it's everything the guy know, I know it's, yeah but it's like it was like i want to say it's like 1856 in france these guys were digging in a mine they were digging like they were blasting stuff out and this pterodactyl like comes out of this crevice it takes a few steps makes a shriek and then it dies so that's when i read when i read this and i'm here we're talking about a coal mine that's what made me think of maybe they were digging in this coal mine they got to about an inch away from it or something and it allowed air to get to it, and they're like, oh, okay, there's no coal here. We're going to walk away. And they leave, and this thing wakes up and breaks out. The thing is, like, I just I just don't even know how that would work. Like, with a lizard getting trapped in stone, like, even on that sort of level, it's just such a uniquely strange thing. It is. A, it's a weird phenomenon. There, But there's, a, there's, a, there's accounts of it, and... It's it's weird. So that's what made me think of that. And maybe it was something that was encased in rock, and then these it got exposed to air, and it woke up, and now it's walking around. The other thing, the other thing we're talking about is how reptiles just don't generally hang out a lot in caves. No, they don't. It's not really a common thing. You you see salamanders, you see newts. Depending on what part of the world you're in, you're going to see crabs. You're going to see crayfish, cave fish. Uh, harvestmen, which are a type of cave scorpion. You're going to see that sort of stuff. But reptiles don't really hang out in caves. It's not a conducive environment for them. No, but if something was around a long time ago and it got encased in this stone and then we dug it up recently. Yeah. That's why I think maybe it could have happened. And we know how like how it works with fossils. Layers and layers start building up over time. If it's been trapped down there in some sort of pocket he got in somehow, mm -hmm. and I guess he could have been buried. Don't get me wrong. That's a stretch of a theory, and I know it. I, I just really wish there's more information on some of these cases where... Because I remember you talking about this. There's another one with like frogs coming out of trees and stuff, mm -hmm. right? Yep. Like they were cutting down trees, and they found like just like this solid tree where frogs are coming out mm -hmm. and then they open that they're cutting the tree down and inside the stump frogs just start popping out like just from inside the stump that's so strange it, 
it's so weird. We should do. We should go back to this. We should I'm, do a video on this, and hopefully the computer won't explode this time. Hopefully the, the hopefully that wasn't specifically what made the Men in Black want to take the <laughs> to, to take the videos down. At the and time. it was a top five, so it could have been one of five things. <laughs> We're gonna narrow it down slowly <laughs> to what it was, even though I think I have a theory about what it was. Which one do you what do you think it was? That everything is connected. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was the number one. Oh, no, we don't have time to yeah, get into that Yeah, we don't have time right to now. get into that. That's, that's a whole can of worms. That's a whole can of worms right there. Mm-hmm. But, so, we, we've talked about this for a while. And what would you say if I told you that there is a large flying creature that seems to be pseudo-reptilian that can project light, and it's not this creature? A large winged reptile creature that shoots light, you say? Yeah, yeah. When I was doing research on this, I'm like, this sounds really familiar. This sounds like something I've heard before, but I know I haven't looked into the Van Meter monster before. And so I started digging around, like, oh, yeah, the Ropin from, like, Malaysia. No, it was from, oh, God, why can't I remember where it's from? It's from, like, the Malaysian area. And it is pretty much the description of the Van Meter monster on the opposite side of the world. It kind of gets a little more of a... Credit to the idea of this hollow earth where, like, there's these interconnected, like, under things under the tunnels under the earth. Yeah, and, and this thing popped up around, uh, I think the earliest case I found was from, like, 1938. And there's no way these people would have heard of the Van Meter monster on the other side of the world. That I feel like that lends a lot of credibility to both stories. So, in, the, in those accounts, was it... Just hanging out? Was it aggressive? Uh, it, it's something that's still even seen. It, it, it wasn't something that just showed up for a while. These things are seen there from time to time. Like, they'll get flaps of sightings of Ropin. And it is pretty much straight up the freaking Van Meter monster. That is so cool. Like, But the thing is, like, those are two very different environments on totally opposite parts of the world. It just makes me wonder the heck's going on. Well, you see that with a lot of stuff in the paranormal. You see that with Bigfoots, Yetis... Yeah, please use sources, which is I've I've heard enough of those to make me believe that's a real thing that's just out there, you know. So I'm not so, I'm not surprised that something that somebody else has reported saying they've seen these things. The other thing is like I actually thought that there was another one that was out there that had a similar description to this too, but I couldn't find it. I want I want to say I had read something about a long time ago about a um, glowing phosphorescent pterodon like creature in the Mex I think it was the Mexico area. Mm. But when I went back I just couldn't find any information. But I think there's like this trend of these sort of sightings out there, which really makes me think this might be more on the likely side to be true than the unlikely side to be true. And that one did they say it smelled really bad? Um I don't remember getting a specific description of it smelling bad. Okay. Like, I had to ask that, like, because it was just scratching the back of my mind because I know that was a thing about the Van Meter monster. But then again, I think that may have not have been just because of the creature. I think that was because it was coming from the mine. Well, also, I mean, have you ever been around a large reptile? They stink. Yeah, they stink. They don't, they don't smell good. Mm-hmm. They, 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 have a, they have a thick reptile-y musk to them. <laughs> like, have you ever, like, picked up a turtle and really got a good whiff of that turtle? No, I just don't pick up random turtles and go... <laughs> Yeah, it smells like a turtle. That smells like a tur- maybe a, maybe a really creepy like sadistic chef does that where he goes, yeah, live turtle. No, I don't. I don't do that. Well, I there are a lot of turtles around where where I grew up, and I would I would always pick them up and like carry them across the road and stuff like that, and, and smell you'd them. Get that turtle smell on your hands and stuff. You really left out the part of the story where you go, yeah, if there were turtles, I picked them up, I smelled them so that I would know what they <laughs> smell like and. We were close to because of it. You were making this way creepy. It was just, it was just a sweet. I was a sweet little Vic Whaley getting turtles and making sure they made it to the other side of the road. There, it wasn't. If there wasn't nothing <laughs> creepy to it. I wasn't sniffing the turtles. It's just, Looking you know, at, you get, you get down what the turtle smells like. Look in the shell, going. This is oh, mine that, now. That's a bad. That's a bad idea. They carry salmonella really what? bad. What? Yeah, turtles carry salmonella like did you really find bad. This out, did you find this out the hard way? No, I, I, I just knew it because my mom would always go, Vic. Don't touch that turtle, it has salmonella. <laughs> my mom was always like stupid afraid of salmonella. I don't know why. Like every time we there, we had chicken, like she had to sanitize everything. Like literally everything. Now, are you sure that's not just like one of those weird myths that your parents just tell you, like, you know, that it's illegal to drive a riot around with that little light in your car? 
My parents never told me that. My parents told me that all the time. They're like, it's illegal to drive with the light, like your 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 inside light on. I did not know that until just now. Yeah. But no, actually, truthfully, maybe it is an old wives' tale. I've never gone back and like fact checked. Do turtles have salmonella? We're getting way yeah, off. Subject. We are getting way off subject. I'm, it's it's it happens. But okay, but back to what we were saying. Like reptiles have this very strong musky smell, and it can kind of carry. And I hear like. With bigger reptiles, it's even like more pronounced. Like with people who work with Komodo dragons, they'll t- they'll talk to you about like the smell they have. Why is it that these large cryptids have this constantly? And some uh, Bigfoots have this too, and other I know some other winged humanoids have this thing too, where they they just smell funky, like they just smell bad, and it's just horrendous. Yeah, I, I, my first response was that we're just not used to being around large animals. But I I grew up with horses, and horses they have they have a horse smell, but it's not like real bad. Mm. Uh, maybe it has something more to do with their exposure to the elements? Mm-hmm. Oh. I mean, I don't think hunt... I mean, I've been around, like, you know, live deer or large cats mm-hmm. and stuff before, and I've never... and I've Or dogs, even, but you... Oh, cats... Large cats have a stink. But but it's nowhere near to the point where you see a large eight-foot winged creature with a light shining off of its head. You shot it, by the way, and it doesn't matter. And you also need to add that it smells bad. Like, I feel just a, a bad smell, which probably goes with it because it's in the woods. It's just a thing. But it would have to be bad that it registers on your concern meter I th- I think for, oral, for that to come up. I think olfactory memory is actually one of the longer-lasting memories. So it might be connected to, like, how the mind works when it comes to smells. So people, like, they may not be able to get a good description. just think they know that it's stunk, man. They remember that. And I, I want to say that, that scent memory is one of the memories we hold on to longer than a lot of the other memories. Okay. So it might be that, or maybe it's just these things have such a pungent musk that, that it just is like that. Like, think about, like, skunk apes and stuff. Mm-hmm. Like, it would make sense that a large primate would have a real potent musk, and it's in Florida where it's probably picking up a lot of moisture in the air, and it's probably not <laughs> washing that often. <laughs> But yeah, and it, it is interesting that these things always seem to carry that um, that particular sort of thing. And also, like, even kind of getting into what we're going to be talking in our extended section about, like, Dulcie. Like, mm-hmm. one of the things they kept saying was, like, the aliens at the Dulcie thing had this really strong, horrible odor to them. That's so, that's so weird. That's, just, that's what we say. Like, it's aliens. It's Bigfoot. It's the Van Meter visitor. They smell. <laughs> Like maybe, maybe there's a connection there. Maybe know. these things all come from a dimension that smells terrible. Maybe we're just too hung up on this. I don't know. <laughs> We've been hung up on a lot of weird stuff, I think, in this episode. So do you think that the Van Meter visitor is real? Like, Do you think that it's that or it's a hoax or what is it? I, I put it in the more likely category. Mm-hmm. Um, mainly because a lot of very respected people saw it. We have a similar situation from the other side of the world where likely they never would have heard heard of the story, kind of giving it some extra credence. There were a lot of sightings of it. The story's been in the town memory for a long time. I would put it in the more likely. What about you? Um, I'm willing to believe that I think this could be a real thing. I think that it has been shown there are probably likely to be large lizards that are still out there and there are these large creatures that are still out there that we just have not that we just don't see very often you know so it makes me believe this dude now the light on its head i i don't know if that i don't know if that makes it like a lot like an actual like a thing like a real creature has this i don't know did you know there's actually a lot of stories throughout uh, around this time period of people encountering things like pterodons and other sort of yeah 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 yeah, yeah. i've heard of like the large like dinosaur sightings before like that's a thing like that is a thing yeah especially around this time period it's just really common to have those sort of pterodon sightings Mm -hmm. like there there are several stories of like cowboys going out and trying to track down these weird dragon like things yeah i mean from like the cut i mean and also like but think about the time period we're in. We're like 1903. Like, there's some animal species still being discovered. Like, we haven't, like, like investigated a large part of, like, a lot, of, a lot of the world. So, yeah. I think people were inclined to believe that, like, that large crypt, creature crypt is probably out there. Truthfully, what makes me the most curious about this case is, could we go track down this mine and open it up and go down there? I think that there there's a book that came out. It's actually called the Van Meter Monster. No, the Van Meter Visitor. Van Meter Visitor. Thank you. 
that you that you correct him. You can actually get on Amazon. It was done by like in like two thousand. I know that it was done in two thousand thirteen. Um, because I thought about ordering it because it seemed like a really good book. Uh, and it was written by it was it Coleman? What was the person's name? By all accounts, it's supposed to be very good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it had like oh, like almost like four or five uh, stars on the thing. And the excerpts where I found where uh, it had sketches of the cast, that those sketches were from that book. Mm. The author's name is Chad Lewis. He's one of the main authors of the book. Um, it's really cool. It's uh, Chad. Lu uh, Chad Lewis is the author, the Van Meter uh, visitor. You guys should totally pick it up. It's on Amazon. We gotta get a copy for the studio. I think that'd be a good idea to get a copy of it for the studio. Yeah, I wouldn't mind having that. I always like yeah. to discuss like flying humanoids. I don't know if this one would really count as a flying humanoid, because they kind of talk about kind of walking on its wings, kind of like how you see in sketches of pterodons and bats kind of do it, but it looks like this was more arched up. Mm -hmm. Like bats kind of more crawl on their belly <laughs> sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, I actually. Back when I was teaching survival, I actually found a... Oh, okay. I didn't find a wounded bat. Someone told me about it because one of the tennis instructors went, Hey, guys, look what I can do, and smacked a bat out of the What? Air. Yeah. He, That's such a dick move. Yeah. He jacked the thing up real bad, and I ended up uh, nursing it back to health over the course of the summer. I'm kind of surprised I didn't get fleas and rabies from it. I was <laughs> playing kind of fast and loose on that one. But like we, we became little buddies. Like he, he would, in, I kept him in my little cabinet area, and he'd snuggle up in the back. And then each morning, I'd just pick him up and put him on my shirt, and I'd make sure he got food, make sure he got water. And then one day, he just looked at me and flew away and never saw him again. But he's, he's a cute little buddy for the yeah. summer. Oh. But, um, the Van Meter <laughs> Monster, it's really cool. Uh, let us know, by the way, in the comments below what you guys think it is. Does it sound more bat-like? Does it sound more like a Mothman? Lizard-like? Let us know what you guys think. As much as I wanted to be a Mothman, I don't think it is. I'm a, I'm all for Team Pterodon here. <laughs> and a lot of people think it's a proto-Mothman story because it happened like 50 years before the events of Point Pleasant, so... Well, maybe. Yeah. So, um, We ready to jump into our extended segment? I think so. So, I hope you guys have enjoyed this episode so far. If you guys have enjoyed the episode, please don't forget to leave us a, leave us a review on what you guys think of the episode. Um, you guys can actually go over wherever you guys get podcasts, leave us a review, leave a comment. It really helps out the podcast when you guys do that. But until next time, keep believing. Because we'll keep listening. Okay. Dulcie. There, uh, you cannot really talk about Dulcie without talking about Philip Schneider. He's, he's kind of the man at the center of the whole thing, and... Truthfully, I'm a little mixed on him. Like, you you guys who are Patreons, you guys know that we've talked about Philip Snyder in our extended segments before. We talked about when we talked about um, Val Valiant Thor. Mm -hmm. And we've gotten into Dulcie a little bit, but never, never, I think, giving it its full credit or its due, or I guess its look, that would probably what we're going to do here in the, in the extended episode here of the podcast. But if you've never heard of Dulcie, like, if you've never heard, it's a fantastic story. So, kind of what what happened is, suppose this guy named Phil Schneider says that, like, and he's the one is the big guy surrounding this, the information that's going out about it. Back in like it was like 1970, I want to say nine in the in the mid in the mid 70s, he says that he was approached by the government to contract to start building these underground bases for the United States government. And at the time, I want to say that he actually said that like the United States government at the time was like working with Grays. Yeah, and he also said he worked at like Area Fifty One and yeah. a few other places too. So the the United States government is contracting him as an engineer to build these bases all over the country, and um, and he's working and, he, and and the United States is doing this while working with Gray aliens, and while he is working with the Gray aliens, one day they accidentally blasted this mine shaft. They blasted this section of a base open. And when he opens it up, it actually opens up in this. 